and at this point in time we had gone about 45 feet down and then back up and here this hole was in the wall about that big around and it, there was a stalactite hanging right down the middle of it. It's the only stalactite I had seen in the cave that wasn't just little ones. This was a big one and I have it in my collection of things. So I broke it off, made the hole big enough for him to get in, and he was crawling in there, and I started to hand him the light so he could do what we had been doing, you know, several days. He came tearing out of there, his mind, uh, eyes were big as human eyes can get, and he said, what's in there, what's in there, I'm not going back in there. And I said, well, what did you see? He said, I didn't see anything. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay. Now he had been in tighter places than that and had not responded that way. So I got this little beam of light, you know, in a very dark place here. <laughs> and I thought, that is divine terror. You know, that's supernatural terror. So I figured there's got to, that is either where the Ark of the Covenant is or it's the way to get to it, one or the other. And God doesn't want this fella to know where it is. So anyway, he said, he, he just said, I, I, am, I must get out of here. So off he went. So I made the hole big enough for me to get in. I got in there and folks, it was full of rocks, bigger than these here up to within 18 inches or so of the seat. If this young man hadn't been terrorized and come scooting out of there like he did, I would not have gone in that place. But who needs rocks? We've been moving thousands of them for three years. So anyway, I crawled in there with a the flashlight and I crawled around on top of the rocks and I shined the light down between the cracks in the rock and there a gold, flat gold thing reflected back at me. So I moved over and shined down to another. There was two reflections, one here, one there, and one over here. So I knew it was a flat gold top and I thought the Ark of the Covenant. I forgot about the cherubims, you know, sitting on top. They'd have been poking up through it. That was the top of the mercy seat. But anyway, I started moving these rocks and I stuck them everywhere I could. By the time I got down to that gold surface, I had them behind my shoulders, leaning back against them. And uh, it, turned, it was the table of showbread. Well, hey, that's not a bad thing, huh? <laughs> But anyway, I was looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And it was only then that I took time to carefully examine the rest of the chamber. See, I had just crawled in, took a quick look, and started checking down under the rocks. So as I moved the flashlight along the wall, I saw a stone box sitting against the wall about this low, this much space between it and the ceiling. The lid was broke, slid around, and right above it was a crack with dark brown looking material at the bottom of, on the bottom of this crack. And I was able to see the top of the lid of the box. On both sides of the broken pieces was more of this brown stuff. All of a sudden I realized I was sitting in front of the Ark of the Covenant and that Christ's blood had come down. I had never heard anybody preach anything about that sort of conversation. And it was too much for me. I, when I regained consciousness and looked at my watch again, 45 minutes had passed from the time I crawled in the chamber. Because I figured I'd find the Ark of the Covenant in there, I wanted to know what time it was. So anyway, it was 2 o'clock when I entered the chamber. And after I 
regained consciousness, yeah, it was 245. Yeah. I couldn't see down in there, yeah, but I knew what it was. Later, Ron Wyatt would confirm that this was the Ark of the Covenant, and that the blood on the mercy seat was from someone who had only one human parent. There were no paternal chromosomes except for one Y chromosome. Jesus was God's only begotten Son, just as he said he was. The Bible prophesied that Christ's blood would be sprinkled on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, but as it was to be kept secret until our time, it was partially, but not totally, hidden in symbols. Matthew recorded an earthquake at the cross, which formed a crack in the ground below it. John tells us that when the Roman soldier pierced the side of Christ, blood and water ran out. The blood and water apparently ran down the earthquake crack. The prophet Isaiah wrote that Jesus, when he was bruised and broken, would sprinkle many nations. Jesus himself said, when he initiated the communion service, that he would enter into a covenant with all people through his blood, the blood of the covenant. The blood would confirm this covenant. When Jesus became the sacrifice, he sprinkled his blood himself, and thus fulfilled the role of the high priest. He then became both high priest and victim. Paul told us that Jesus confirmed the covenant in the same way as Moses confirmed the old covenant with the Israelites. In Exodus, we can read how the first covenant was confirmed. In his letter to the Hebrews, Paul writes how Jesus confirmed the everlasting covenant in the same way that Moses confirmed the covenant between the people and God. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats, with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament, which God hath enjoined unto you. He took blood and water, and sprinkled it upon the words of the covenant. This symbolized two things, that these very words, written in the book, are the covenant and the blood symbolized forgiveness for breaking that covenant, as the blood from the sacrificed animal was always a symbol of Christ. Scarlet wool and hyssop represented the true mission of the sacrificial lamb. In the Bible, we're told that wool symbolizes purity, and scarlet symbolizes sin. So just as the wool became scarlet, thus Christ, the innocent lamb of God, took upon himself our sin. In the scripture, hyssop is a symbol of cleansing. Jesus took our sins to cleanse us. From this ceremony, we know exactly what to expect in the antitype. According to the type, we can expect Jesus to confirm the true covenant by sprinkling his blood and water over what now makes up the covenant, while simultaneously offering himself to cleanse people from their sins. These people he confirmed the covenant with were therefore asked by Christ to keep the very words of that covenant. John reveals to us a secret. He tells us that the blood and water is here on earth as a testimony. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. The prophet Isaiah is connecting Jesus' death on the cross to a time where he will sprinkle many nations. Isaiah continues on to say that this will one day be revealed and will leave even the world's rulers utterly speechless. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him for what had not been told them they will see and what they had not heard they will understand. When the prophet Daniel was given the task of prophesying of the coming Messiah he made a clear reference to the mission of Jesus. To finish the transgression, and to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. It's also written that when Jesus died, the curtain between the holy place and the most holy place was ripped in two, but the Ark of the Covenant was not there. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, 
and the rocks rent. Right before the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, the Ark was hidden. The very Ark of the Covenant, with the testimony of God, or the law, that the people had broken and that we need atoning for. God knew where Jesus was to suffer and die for humanity, and 600 years before the crucifixion, he hid the Ark right under the Golgotha Escarpment. So what does this discovery tell us? Well, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God really did give his Son, to take upon himself the punishment for our sins. But this discovery tells us much more. It tells us what God's covenant with us is, and what law we have broken, and need forgiveness for. But it also tells us what the covenant with us is not. And now the excitement begins, so watch. God wants to reach everyone, and in the past, he has used object lessons to teach the truth. When Ron Wyatt asked when this discovery was going to be shown to the world, he was told something very special, that it would not be shown until the Mark of the Beast law was passed. The Bible tells us of a deception that will come upon the world. The Antichrist will place himself in God's temple, claiming to be God himself. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Ron was told that the law of God will be shown to expose the Antichrist, and to save the world from this deception. <laughs> 